Yeah, man, I appreciate you agreeing to do this. Um, I've I've watched your content like you seem like very theory based, like very well researched. Like you were doing that reaction to a uh, history video about uh, Weimar Germany, and my understanding is like you do more. You do more like historical analysis, political theory, things like that. It's not like really political hot takes, right? Uh, I do a bit of both. It just depends. Uh, I think my video essays and streams are very different, you know? Like um, the essays are a lot more careful and thought through, and then the live stuff is a lot more rolling around in the mud with crazy people. So, yeah, a bit of both. See, so you offer some versatility. See, yeah. actually, that's the thing is like, I because I... I don't like do really anything with Twitch and I don't spend quite a bit of time on Twitch. So it's just YouTube. So like, I guess mm -hmm. I'm just familiar with either your appearances in destiny stream or on like some of the hippy dippy stuff okay. and then your video essays. So like, I have never, I've never had the pleasure of experiencing a loner box stream or to know how schizophrenic it can get. So it seems the, to me. Yeah. I'm a slightly different person on the, on the streams, but yeah, I'm probably more like myself than I am with the scripted stuff. But so you do script the essays or is it yeah, like yeah, kind they're of completely, off the top? Oh, they're completely scripted, yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, so it was interesting because I mean, obviously you were on the, the list of people eventually to talk to uh, once I was able to like make my way through people in Destiny's like I don't want to say orbit because you're well beyond that, but I mean in his like peer group, like a Econa Boy is another one as well. But when I saw that you were on Wix, uh, our moderates based or cringe panel. Mm -hmm. Um, the topic itself just really, it, it's really important to me because I'm on Wick's ass 24 seven about his centrism. I'm like, dude, you gotta, we gotta push you leftward, man. We gotta make you a radical progressive. And he's like, no, I refuse. And so it's like this ongoing tension and it's a lot of fun. And when I saw that you were going to be on there, I'm like, okay, we got the big guns there because loner box is definitely going to be, I think, pushing against Wick centrism. And I was shocked. I was like, oh shit, they've co-opted my boy. They they have they have unfortunately pigeonholed Loner Box into defending the moderates. And then when I went back and watched the stream, now I get it because some of the progressives on that panel were saying some truly weird shit. I mean, so. like all the progressives, like all three of them were just fucking insane, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, which is just what happened. Like, that's just a perfect example of how the Overton window works, right? Because you can be mm -hmm. the very progressive person, but if you're in a panel with someone who's got like, one guy's got a USSR flag behind him and the only talking point he has is like the Democrat ratchet effect and the other two are saying it would actually be okay if people started murdering cops and shit. So hey, yeah, um, that's a bit. Yeah, no, I, yeah, that was, that was bizarre. I mean, I guess I'm, I, the USSR thing, and not that I'm a Stalinist or a Soviet Union sympathizer there, but I guess I've gotten so used to that. The cop, the cop thing, is really sketched to me because for a few reasons so um i've got you know not to be that guy but it's like i can't i can't pretend that this isn't the case i grew up with people who are dear friends who have become cops so like i just by definition it's hard for me to reconcile these people that i know trust and respect who are uniformed and badged police i, I could never get on the a cab train right because that would require me to commit to the idea that my friends are bastards simply by virtue of their profession right mm -hmm. now if they act like bastards in their profession that's different but i have no evidence that they do so the whole thing was super sketch and then to take it further and not just all cops are bastards but uh, you know it'd probably be a good thing if they all die or if they were all killed or we'd be indifferent to the deaths of all of them yeah that was like in addition to being like tos you know like within the ballpark i feel of like a tos violation i can't believe that all all of them kind of conceded that or concluded that it was very weird yeah um i really hope that's not because i i don't really know that many people in twitch poll anymore so if that's where mm -hmm. things have gone i mean yeah i don't know i feel like there's just a huge difference between uh probably the same uh, in the UK as well, where the difference between being a leftist in real life and a leftist online is so wide like you can be a very yeah, left-wing person in the priority. real world yeah uh and compared to other left-wing parties and even commentators um but as soon as you step into the internet like there's you can get called a fascist or whatever like so easily by people who have just gone way further than you and i think it was a bit better back when uh a lot of these groups had people like maybe bernie or um 
Corbyn to kind of like hold their hand through the process, even though they were quite toxic back then as well. But I think now that that mm -hmm. defeat happened from both of those people in the English speaking world, then now it's just like, well, we're not winning for the next 10, 20 years. Fuck it. You know, let's just go all the way. Um, well, it's interesting. It's interesting you say that. So I'm not too well versed in UK politics, but I do know, correct me if I'm wrong, but like here, Starmer has apparently like caught a lot of flack because hasn't he basically said that if if labor gets into power they would not revoke rishi sunak's or or the conservative party's uh like pro-police legislation which a lot of people on the left in the uk are saying that you know it's it's basically creating a police state and he's caught a lot of flack from his base saying that he wouldn't repeal it yeah it's really bad yeah or, or am um, i making that up no no he's yeah i think he's he's used some really weird like slippery lawyer language about it but yeah it looks like it's not going to get repealed uh, which is really bad because I, I, I imagine the reason he's done that is because Extinction Rebellion and Just Up Oil have maybe made protesting very unpopular recently. And mm -hmm. Keir is just like the ultimate, wherever the populace goes, I'll go. Like, um, even if it's not even that, because I can't, I can't imagine that even being popular within the, within his own party, let alone the country. But um, yeah, there's, the problem with Keir is like he's definitely done a lot to try and remove all the Corbyn uh, stuff from the party. So that's just meant purging like a lot of leftists a lot often for very trivial reasons. But um, mm -hmm. some of the left wing policies that were put in by Corbyn are still on the Labour program. Like, but my they keep on they seem to keep on reducing over time. So I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Like, I'd like Remember to think the there are a couple of reasons he won't just become like another Tony Blair, but um, I don't expect him to be much better either. Wow, that's interesting. You're talking about Starmer, not Sunak, yeah, Starmer, right? Yeah, that, yeah. That's, oh, wow. It's interesting too, and again, not to get too far into it because I'm, I'm so out of my depth here, but I've, I have friends who, who live across the pond and one of them identifies as a progressive now in my opinion just given like the niche topics that he focuses on like things like iq an example like he he some of his rhetoric some of his fixation is more like centrist or conservative and so he was telling me when oh who did sunak replace was it liz truss yeah um that when sunak replaced her he said he was actually pretty surprised initially in in sunak's premiership because this is this is how he characterized him. I don't know if that's true, so you'd have to fact check me, but that Sunak was more bipartisan and his cabinet wasn't nearly as regressively conservative as as trusts and uh, uh, oh, 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 shit. What's his name? What's the your, your diet Trump? What? Um, Boris. Oh, Boris. Yeah, Boris Johnson. Is, so is that true that Sunak is more moderate and more bipartisan than, um, the, than those two? When it came, well, for the economy, Definitely. Uh, for immigration, I think Sunak is probably just as bad, maybe worse. But when it came mm -hmm. to the economy, which is everyone's biggest concern now in the UK, it's like the economy, and I think second is housing. Um, that's what dominates for most people in the UK. Um, Trust thought she could be like Margaret Thatcher. She thought she could give massive tax breaks to the rich um, in the middle of an inflation crisis, which is probably one of the dumbest right. things anyone could do. Um, mm -hmm. She tried to I think she ref she refused a windfall tax for the uh, current inflation crisis as well. But she, uh, mm -hmm. even though everyone else in Europe was doing it, she did a couple more things as well that were pretty dumb. But like, she, was she was she going to pair those tax cuts with spending cuts, or did she do like most Republicans and keep spending at commensurate levels, but also cut revenue through taxation? I don't know if she was actually going to do spending cuts. That's what I uh, can't remember off the top of my head. So. Uh, Sorry to no, derail the train of thought there, but that's so funny it, it, because that's how conservatives here, especially the modern day Republican Party like Reagan was terrible about this. Let's cut taxes, cut taxes, cut taxes, but spending still remained ludicrously high under the Reagan mm -hmm. administration. And same thing with President Bush and President Trump. And so I was just curious if uh, your conservatives kind of do the same thing. Um, I don't think they did it for this one. Um, actually, I don't think they I think there was maybe like one reduction in spending that I did, but I can't remember what it was. Um, it was like a freeze on energy prices she did as well. Um, so that did that would have cost money for the government to freeze energy prices. So gotcha. yeah, um, but yeah, it was just like I think the problem is not only that it caused a massive crash in the pound, but also that that kind of approach to the economy is just not popular anymore. Um, people don't like 
free market like Thatcherism anymore compared to what they used to in the in the eighties and nineties. So the fact that that's the case even for the Conservative Party now is probably quite positive. But um yeah, you I think guess. so. So they're leaning. So the Conservative Party in the UK is leaning more into um, like they're more friendly towards government regulation, like not quite so laissez faire, you know, just let the market dictate whatever it wants. Um, not as much as they used to be. Um, but a lot of that had to do with COVID as well, right? Because I think the whole comparison people made during COVID was that it was becoming almost like a war economy, like the government intervening to give everyone uh, sort of uh, relief funds and like working as a self-employed person uh, at the time and going between jobs as well, between being like a music teacher and a YouTuber. Uh, I got I managed to claim quite a lot of money from the government for COVID just as a kind of relief fund. So Good for you, man. Good for yeah, you. <laughs> like they were like they were very, they were pretty generous for a lot of it, yeah. um, at least for certain people, like probably people who were, in a space to be like voting so um yeah but like it's still there are still a few problems with the way the conservatives do it, and there are still um like they are still very much a very pro-business party with lots of very big donors but just not as much as they used to be you know it's interesting too like i said i'm so out of my depth on a lot of this but like even though i consider myself uh, a progressive a social democrat much like you um what's funny is obviously like, you know, I think that's great, the idea of like republicanism in the UK, the idea to, to disband the monarchy. But I got to tell you, sidebar, I had this almost strange level of admiration. I know this like could like kill whatever stocks I have with a lot of people, like a lot of credibility. But I was actually this weird like Queen Elizabeth simp, like to the extent that when she died, it actually like visibly affected me. And it was so strange because I was never a British citizen. I'm an American native. And, um, you know, I, th I think the idea of a hereditary monarchy is ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. But I guess it was because she was such a political constant. You know, here in the United States, we've had so much flux and we're seeing it in the UK as well. I would argue not nowhere near to the same extent that we see it in the United States. And just seeing this like, as kind of a history and politics geek, this one thread of continuity of Western politics just dying, you know, at a, at, a, at a time of, of great uncertainty. It was really weird, even as, as, a, as an American, it was like, I watched for like hours on an end, like the, the coverage of her, of her funeral and everything else, people, you know, paying their respects when she was lying in state. Um, and it's interesting because one of the videos I distinctly recall, or one of the, I guess, feuds or whatever, um, with you, uh, after the queen's death was, it may have been with Kevin Logan or somebody, but you, you know, not that you were taking a pro monarchist state, but I was actually pretty sympathetic to your position where people who were like openly celebrating the queen's death and how it was kind of tacky, even though it was also understandable somewhat. Um, but I just want to share that with you. That is a guy who's like on the panel with Wick advocating for Democrats playing ruthlessly and being willing to break tradition and all these things. Um, just to show you that there is some nuance there, I was really strangely affected by the Queen's death. Okay. Did you go through that at all as someone who I assume is not a monarchist? I, know, I, did, I, didn't, I didn't care. I was just like, it is what it is. Uh, like, yeah, I've never cared that much about the monarchy at all. Um, it was pretty annoying looking at people, like, first of all, celebrating her death and then following it up with like, well, fuck, now I celebrate someone's death. I need to have a good reason for it, right? And then like, sure. you, they would give you 10 bad things that she did and like nine of them were bullshit, right? Um, especially a lot to do with like the ahistorical stuff about the empire and all the other things. So, or yeah, so that was really weird. Uh, and lots of really ridiculous Twitter threads that went viral about it as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, that was, what about her as far dumb. as like a pillar of continuity though? Like, was it strange for you? Like, you know, she's the only monarch you've ever known. And I think it was like 80% of Britons have ever known the idea that, you know, she's not there anymore. Does that, was that like strange to go through as somebody who was technically a subject? uh no <laughs> yeah. i'm pretty indifferent yeah that is, it must be like the anglophile in me to just kind of again i it's completely ridiculous i'll totally cop to it and i was really quiet about it on twitter because i didn't want to i didn't want to like get um in any sparring matches over it but like i was like dude this is it's like a historic moment man in, in a in a time of great political turmoil but um anyway um in terms of like what i really wanted to pick your brain about so some of it has to do with um, 
things that were said on the WIC panel, but actually, you know, as I went back and, and thought about it before I sent you the, the uh, DM kind of giving you a little bit about me and, and my policy positions, I, I felt that it was actually kind of a broader, there was an opportunity for a broader conversation. And then even from what little I, uh, of your stream that I heard today, um, when you're talking about, I think it was Article 48 in the Weimar Republic and how it, one thing led to another and it was ultimately part of the basis by which that, you know, Hitler assumed emergency powers. And you, you, you made an interesting point that I've heard Wick and others say before about, you know, you got to be careful about what you do with tradition and establishing precedent because it's dangerous and can be potentially co-opted by um, bad faith actors. And so, so to me, that's kind of the broad, I guess, the broad topic that I'd like to pick your brain about, because I think we have some disagreement there. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if uh, you can either move me or maybe I can move you. Um, but uh, I guess before we dive into it, do you, do you have any questions about like my general, like, do, do you need to know kind of like generally speaking where I stand on certain things to kind of have a the basis for a good faith conversation? Because I am going to ask you questions about like your general policy disposition, things like how do you feel about universal health care? How do you feel about voting rights, things like that to just kind of establish a record? Do you need anything from me? Uh, no, I think it can kind of come out through the conversation. Unless you had something that you wanted to introduce for the chat, then you can go for it. But otherwise, we can uh, just go into it. Just uh, Well, I guess I would say for quick chat purposes, uh, I'm Josiah. That's my real life name. My YouTube channel is Pondering Politics, which is where you can find me. I used to be called Ruminate. I'm a destiny orbiter, quasi, because I'm just politics only. No drama, no red pill, no culture war shit. Um, and I, I was... I'm really important. IRI and I were the ones to push him to canvas in Savannah, Georgia during the midterm. So we did that. Um, so like I'm trying to push him more towards political content and uh, into progressive activism. And that is an uphill battle. Uh, but that's where that's the, the circles in which I, I traffic. Uh, as far as my politics, just social Democrat, I consider myself a progressive, but coalition building is extremely important. So even though President Biden wasn't Remember my first choice in the 2020 election, if you look at my channel, I am a hardcore, or, or Twitter for that matter, I'm a hardcore Biden simp. Not because Biden is my ideal candidate, but because he is by far the next best, you know, alternative to a Republican. And my primary thesis is that the GOP is the most dangerous political threat by far, not only to the United States and their own constituents, like conservative voters as well, but also, I would argue the world. I mm -hmm. think that the Republican Party being in power is a threat to. You're, well, you're in the. Are you in England still, or did you move to the states? I'm in Scotland. So you're in Scotland. Okay, I'm sorry. So I think even a Republican presidency or Republicans taking control of the United States would have a direct and deleterious effect on you across the pond. So I think it's important that we form whatever coalition we can on the left mm -hmm. to keep Republicans out of power and politically neutralize them. So that's me in a nutshell. Okay. Um, as far as you are concerned, before we get into the topic, I'm just curious, when you call yourself a progressive social democrat, because some of these terms are so, you know, they're, they're open to interpretation, what's your stance on like healthcare? Just out of curiosity, do you think it's like a human right? Do you support it in theory, but getting the nuts and bolts of a policy that's kind of a sticking ground? Like, where are you on, on healthcare? Yeah, I think it's a human right. I mean, I've lived with the National Health Service for my entire life. So the thought of ever having to pay anything to get healthcare is just wild to me. Um, and, you know, if, if you have the money you can and you want to be sped up for like mental health or whatever, you can go private. There's still that option here. Um, as for, I think the difficulty is when is bringing that conversation to a country like America where um no country in Europe that has like a really good healthcare system has to do what America would have to do, right? Like we're not like these massive uh, federalized uh, countries of like 330 million people with massive agreement disagreements across the across the land like that. But um, yeah, like at the very least, I think America needs like a public option, right? But um, I would tend to lean towards universal healthcare. I think, uh, yeah, I think it should be a human right. I think we're in the same ballpark there for all intents and purposes. And that's another reason why I was trying to pick your brain on this to see how much, how much um, congruity that we have, because I'm kind of in the same boat about universal health care and, and quite frankly, even like something even more controversial, like reparations, mm -hmm. Spir like spiritually, conceptually, theoretically, I support rep reparations. I think that that's a moral prerogative. But then when you ask me how on earth would you affect a policy like that? 
I, I don't see how cash payouts are an option. I think like investiture in you know predominantly black or minority uh, neighborhoods, things like that. I think that would be more the direction. It's the same thing for me of like healthcare. I do think it's a human right, um, and I think we need to push aggressively in that direction and allocate as much political capital shrewdly as possible in that direction. Uh, but I'm also aware of the fact that there are major, um, you know, uh, political backlash to it. Like even like you said, and I think this came up in Wick's panel. Most Americans really like their private insurance. Mm -hmm. Now, Bernie Sanders would tell you, well, that's because they haven't had the benefit of universal health care. So if, if, they, if we invoked a system where it was a single payer system and there wasn't a private insurer option, they, he thinks that they would learn to love that option more than private insurance. And maybe that's the case. But you know, that's going to that's be a hard pitch you know, to, to make to uh, most Americans, because it's not even just most conservatives, it, it most uh, liberal and progressive leaning Americans too, they like their private insurance. Mm -hmm. um, what about voting rights? Because um, I'm sure you're aware if you follow politics here that red states and, and conservatives are really churning out efforts to suppress voter turnout because they feel like they can't win elections otherwise. Um, would you support in the United States robust federal top-down voter protections, which tell red states, none of this, you know, you can't bring a piece of bo or bottled water to people in lines because that's considered vote solicitation, you know, uh, universal mail-in voting and stuff like absentee. Would you support something like that? Um, uh, probably, yeah. Um, I don't know how much of an overreach that is from like federal government, but uh, yeah, like of course we're doing the same thing here as well in the UK. They've introduced like an ID system for voting, which is like insane. If you look at the voter fraud numbers in the UK, I think it's like I think some years it's been double digits for people trying to fraudulently vote. You know. Um, so yeah, you should be able to just turn up, give your name and address, and you're done, right? But um, sure, yeah. So I, I think it should be like I, th I think actually voting should be mandatory. <laughs> That's as far as I would go. I think if you, even if you turn up and spoil your ballot, you have to turn up and do something there. Um, I think that's I think that should be mandatory. I, you know, it's funny. I've um, I've heard people say that before, and I don't have an objection to it. Uh, but I guess this is the American education system kicking in, like. Do you know offhand, like any major Western nation which compels that? Like, cause, because I don't offhand, I'm sure they're out there. I assume the UK doesn't, but does like Germany or, or um, Canada, as far as you know, do, do you know of like major developed countries that compel mandatory voting? Australia uh, does. Australia, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what's the UK's like voter ID thing? Is it like free, government issued, no. convenient? No, you, oh, but shit, like there's, course. yeah, you'd have to, I think the cheapest one you can get is like 30 or 40 pounds provisional license. Nice. Um, but yeah, you do have to pay for something. Yeah, I don't think there's a free. There might wait. There might be a free one, but as far as I know, the ones that the ones that I have that I can use are uh, you have to pay for them. See, that's the thing. It's it's so funny, and I think I've heard Destiny say this before, and I'm sure you've heard him say it. In theory, I'm open to like voter ID laws if they were free. Yeah. You know, if they were sent to everybody, if you had like if you lost yours, you could get another one reissued again free of charge if it was universal. So if I get issued, you know, turn 18 in Arkansas and I get a voter ID and then two years later I moved to New York, it's still valid. And you know what I mean? Like it's universal, it's free, it's cheap, it's convenient. Um but Republicans and conservatives who like voter ID laws, they want to keep or keep it as labyrinthine and you know, expensive and inconvenient as possible. And to me, it's almost like their position on uh, reproductive rights. Mm -hmm. People talk about, oh, they're, we're pro-life and we want to reduce abortions by, you know, legal fiat. And it's like, well, what about like free birth control, universal birth control, mandatory and comprehensive sex education, blah, 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 things like that. Well, you know, I don't know about that. So it's like, you're really not looking for a solution to this problem because if you really wanted to reduce abortion, you would affect all the policies I recommended just there. And same thing with voter ID. If you really wanted to get voter ID passed, you would pitch it to Democrats that way. But yeah, I think the worst like thing, the, the worst thing with the, with the abortion stuff is when you bring that argument to Americans, like, yeah, if you're uh, anti-abortion, you should still want free birth control and family planning and all that. Sometimes it's really frustrating when those voters will say, actually, yes, we do want support for families and all that stuff. But um, or even for mothers who have to give birth and all, but like they'll still vote for the party that bans the abortion but doesn't do the other things. That's really frustrating. <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. Is that what's the situation like that again? And, and and if at any point you know this is 
you don't want to talk about UK politics or stuff like that, let me know. But it, this is kind of a learning opportunity for me. What's the situation with reproductive rights in the UK with respect to not only abortions, but again, comprehensive sex education, contraception, stuff like that, family planning. So in most of Europe, uh, I think abortion on demand is legal for 10 to 12 to 14 weeks, usually just on demand. You just go there, you ask for it, you get it. Um, in the UK, it's 24 weeks, but it's conditional because, but only in a very formal way. So the way it is in the UK, you have to, um, you have to get two doctors to sign off that it would be worse for your mental or physical health to stay pregnant than it would be to get an abortion. And since you're getting it before 24 weeks, it's basically always more healthy to like, like less dangerous to have the abortion, right? Um, so it's just like a formality. They just sign it. I don't think there's ever been a situation where you turn up for like seven weeks and you say, like, I want an abortion. And one doctor's like, hmm, well, maybe your mental health would be better if you stay pregnant. I don't think that ever happens. So it's a formality. That's interesting. Um, which That's I think- interesting. So wait, so just at uh, just so I understand, because so within in the UK, 24 week window, but within that 24 week window, zero to 24 weeks, you still have to get a formal sign off by two physicians. Yeah. OK, I'm sorry. Continue. And yeah. They, yeah, they have to agree that it would be worse for your mental and or physical health to stay pregnant. So but yeah, it's a formality as far as I know. Uh, they also make you do this thing where you have to like uh, they give you this like gray piece of paper and you have to choose your option for what you want to happen to the fetus so there's one of the options is like uh funeral services or cremation or like just uh, donate to science or bin it like you actually have to choose multiple choice through that which is uh pretty fucking dark in my opinion <laughs> but yeah yeah very can you imagine like a republican author like authoring that gray sheet like when it got to bennett it would be like bennett you fucking monster you yeah. know just lob it in the trash i I, um, I don't i don't know the history of it but it really feels like that policy to me just feels like it's there to appease pro-lifers but i have no idea why it's like that um yeah so it's interesting I, so i live obviously in the states north carolina and they just passed it's so this this thing is so messed up so in North Carolina, which is a purple state, by the way, mm -hmm. it is so gerrymandered in favor of the Republican Party. Uh, it's probably second only to Wisconsin um, in terms of Republican favor gerrymandering. It's brutal. They were one vote away from a legislative supermajority, even though we have a Democratic governor, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's this lady named Trisha Cotham who runs in a blue district during the 2022 midterms as a pro-choice progressive Democrat, who, by the way, Famously, like she she was statewide famous because she testified in front of the state house like five or six years ago that she exercised her right to have an abortion. And it was really emotional and she caught a lot of flack from it from her, you know, Republican counterparts. But anyway, so she runs for re-election in 2022 as a pro-choice progressive Democrat in a blue district. And then she's she wins on that platform. She's inaugurated in January 2023. And then in April, she switches parties. She holds a press conference and says, I'm I'm turning to Republican now. And they that so that gave them the one seat they needed to have a supermajority to override the governor's veto. The first thing they do is pass a 12 week abortion ban and she mm. votes for it. Yeah, he tried to override the veto. Uh, they they over excuse me, he issued a veto. They overrode his veto a couple of days ago. But some of the conditions of that piece of legislation are very similar to what you described. So like you have to have two physician visits, they have to agree, um, you know, basically they have to sign off on it. And but they have to be in person, number one. And unlike, I, which I, I assume is the case in the UK, since you all have, you know, the, the National Health Service, you know, it wouldn't be free of cost for the, the mother to go to the doctor, you know, to, to get the sign off. And I imagine it wouldn't be a formality either. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's insane, man, like it, they, um, there were some other provisions in it that are kind of escaping me at the moment, but uh, oh, it, it criminalizes uh, medical abortion like um, the pill after 10 weeks. Whoa. So it's just it's nuts, man. It's absolutely nuts. And I don't know if you know this, but they're actually challenging. Uh, I think it was out of Texas, mifepristone, which is like the, the pill. It's the most common uh, abortifacient that's used in the United States. Uh, one Republican federal judge tried to issue a nationwide ban for it. And then it was countermanned by another one like out of Washington or Oregon. And so it's going before the Supreme Court. But one right wing judge might cause a federal wide or like a nationwide ban on this very common abortifacient. So 
just where we are, dude. Like, it's, it's truly scary here in uh, in the states. I think as far as how bold conservatives are being. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, okay, well, oh, I picked your brain enough on that. So, so I guess again, the, the thrust of it is my. It seems like your position overall when it comes to American politics, this is the impression I, I got from Wix panel and from earlier today, that you don't support Democrats or the left fighting ruthlessly or nearly as ruthlessly as Republicans do to affect their political outcomes. Is that a fair thing to say? That really, really depends. So. Overall, like I see myself as a <laughs> like a rural like consequentialist. Like I think mm-hmm. um, good outcomes are usually the justification for an act. But obviously, if one guy comes into the hospital, uh, you probably shouldn't harvest, kill him and harvest his organs to save five more people. Because then the long-term consequence of that, no one will ever want to visit a doctor again. And then more people will die. So um, when I see the same thing about... Uh, Democrats fighting ruthlessly as Republicans, like I guess with gerrymandering, as far as I know from just a brief glance, it, we're kind of in the state that we are now with that because both parties did it back and forth for so long. Um, when it comes to, it, it would depend on a specific situation. Like I would generally try to avoid it as like a focus. It, it maybe is, maybe the Republicans put Democrats in a position where it's like a necessary thing to do. The thing I worry about though is that um, I feel like a lot of progressives make that like their main thing like we're Mm -hmm. correct and democracy or not even democracy but like process and institutions are just a kind of inconvenience in the way of that right so the like the amount of people who talk about like uh pack the courts or end the filibuster or try like just all this like shortcutting right or gerrymander Mm -hmm. harder and um personally when it comes to that like i think that stuff should always be treated as like a kind of thing that you do whilst holding your nose and more um thing I lean to more is actually, especially given today, is how uh, much Biden has been able to do whilst behaving in the opposite way, whilst trying to reach over to their side and to achieve bipartisan legislation, whether it was with, uh, whether it was with the uh, infrastructure bill, or um, I think it was like a gun law as well. Uh, But yeah, like, yeah, the uh, the safe bipartisan safer communities act. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, So yeah, I think uh, that's that latter approach is the one that I tend to lean a lot more towards. But given the way America is, you'd have to we'd have to be very case by case to see which uh, we're talking about because there's obviously going to be fair. times where you have to like match them at their own game. I'd imagine. Yeah, perfectly fair. Listen again to me. Like I, I think we're going to still have some serious disagreement, but at least in principle, I think we're on the same page. And this was the point that I tried to make to Wick. Um, and, and I'll throw Wick under the bus because I like Wick and I know he can handle it and he and mm-hmm. I have gone back and forth on this. It's a lot of fun. Um, but my point to Wick, because it seems to me he, he pitches himself as an institutional absolutist. And I've had this argument with Destiny too, not so much recently because I think he's embraced the fact that the Republican Party is infinitely worse than the Democratic Party. So I think like some of his centrist rhetoric he's gone away from as much as the online left annoys him. He mm-hmm. cops to the fact that when it comes to the parties in power, Democrats on their worst day are better than Republicans on their best, which is a fact. Um, Wick, I feel like, is a couple of steps behind. And so he, he kind of pitches himself as an institution, as institutionalist to the absolute degree. But he's not, and nobody is. And anyone who tells you, it's kind of like a free speech absolutist. Mm-hmm. You either haven't thought this through all the way or you're a liar. And, and so I just think it's more like you, you haven't thought it through all the way, because in America, we venerate Abraham Lincoln. He was not an institutional absolutist. And in many ways, he, you could easily make a good faith argument that he was a tyrant or was trending in that direction because he accrued executive power to an unprecedented degree. He ignored the Supreme Court. Yep. Non-acquiescence was a thing that, that basically Abraham Lincoln created when he arrested um, a it was a sitting legislator that they were convinced was sabotaging union efforts on behalf of the Confederacy. Lincoln sent the army in to arrest him, and the Supreme Court was like, hey, let him go. And Lincoln goes, no, and then make me. And they were like, shit, we can't. I love that. And I don't think anyone in their right mind would say, no, Lincoln did the wrong thing there. He should have just let Confederate sympathizers continue to sabotage the union. Everybody has a line. Everybody. And I like the fact that you just admitted you did too, and you have to establish it in a case-by-case basis, which is why during the panel when Wick was like, what's your bottom line? I'm like, dude, it's case-by-case. I can't – there is no 
hard set line because it's context specific. So my line, it, you know, I'm, I'm 32 years old. How old are you? 31. 31. So we're, we're the same age. If we were this age when we were born, you know, if we were 30 years old and politically astute, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, my line might be very well different. You know what I mean? Like I, it, you give me the same case, but in a different context and my answer may change. Mm -hmm. So I like that we're kind of on the same page there. Um, may I give you, may I ask you some like specific cases and then you tell me if you think you would support uh, or, or what you would support Democrats do based on the case? Yeah, I will warn you that because I, I remember I tried to read a little bit, but this is like a topic that I uh, venture into very, very little because it's just like, to me, it's just not that interesting. Um, but I can try. Really? Yeah, because no, no, fair. Um, to Go me, ahead. it's like, uh, I care, like, I, t like, I think one of the disclaimers I feel like I have to start making more often is that I don't see myself as an activist. Um, I talk online about things that are interesting to me. And if that's like counterproductive to the movement, I'll do it anyway, because I care about it. Um, or because it's like fun. But um, so like the idea of like advocating for why this part, so I can say like, the, this policy is better than this one for this reason. But when it's sure. like, um, should we uh, subvert the process or like uh, play dirty to get it is maybe less interesting to me. But like, I guess it is like, I don't know, who knows? I might change on that through the conversation. Who knows? Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. And I'll try to make it as interesting as possible. But fair enough. It certainly seemed interesting to you based on, you know, uh, you know, the, the panel and even again, some of the commentary you offered today, which I thought was pretty insightful. But, you know, like one one that kind of jumps out at me is when the Republican Party yeah, I'm sure you're aware of what they did with President Obama's uh, vacancy, right, after uh, Justice Scalia died. And you know, in 2016, you remember that? They, they basically didn't hold a hearing, kept the, the vacancy open until Republican Pre Trump came along. Uh, I didn't know that, but okay. Uh, okay, well, long story short, 2016, a Supreme Court justice dies. The Constitution empowers the president to, to fill that vacancy with the advice and consent of the Senate. So the Senate has to have a hearing, and, th and then they can decide. They don't have to rubber stamp it. If they don't like the president's nominee, they can vote against it. And if enough votes vote against the president's nominee, he has to pick another one. Well, Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader of the Senate, says, well, no, we're not going to hold a hearing because it's 2016 and it's an election year. Now, the election was 10 months away, and it was basically unprecedented. But he did say, we'll have a hearing and vote against him. We're just not going to have a hearing. So the vacancy went unfilled. And that's what allowed Donald Trump to get three Supreme Court vacancies to fill them. And what was funny was the third one that Trump filled, Republicans broke their own rule because it was an election year and there was a vacancy. And instead of saying, well, it's an election year, the American people deserve a vote, um, you know, by picking the next president and then the next president, be it Trump or Biden, can decide. Yeah. They, crammed, they crammed in Amy, Co Amy Coney Barrett with like, two months away from the election. And actually, because of mail-in voting and all that stuff, ballots had already been cast. Now, hmm. to me, that's a textbook example of Republican escalation and a flagrant violation of norms. And so Wick would say, well, we just got to do better next time. I would say the next time there is a Republican president and a Democratic Senate, and there's a vacancy that the Republican president wants to fill, the Democratic Senate says no. We're just going to hold it over. Now, some people would say it's an escalation, right? And like you said, you, you risk doing that, right? Because then it's like, well, that just might piss the Republicans off and, and, and cause like this ever-increasing you know, political escalation. But I guess my question is like stuff like that. I know you know that the GOP is acting in egregious bad faith all the time. Violating norms, escalating rhetoric. They just try to – right now, somebody in the chat pointed out about 40 minutes ago – Marjorie Taylor Greene is trying to impeach Biden for the sixth time in two and a half years, yeah, 10 times that, total yeah. for the GOP. Now, it's not going to go anywhere. Well, I actually, it might because they have the, the majority now in the, the House. But what do you think Democrats or the left should do? Because to me, I guess in the end, it's, there's an asymmetry here of expectation. The left and the right hold the left to a higher standard. Republicans yeah. say we can do whatever we want, but goddamn it, Democrats, you you need to play by the rules that we violate. And I just don't see how, from a politics or philosophy perspective, we can advance good things in this country if that's the case. I don't see how we win. Yeah, I think the I think it is very hard to argue against doing exactly what they do back to them. Like that seems kind of odd to me. Uh, 
Because I, I guess the only fear, I'm just kind of doing a devil's advocate almost, is that um, mm. there are probably like modern, like mo- uh, moderate Republicans, and I think moderate, like uh, fed- Republican federal judges who uh, are maybe growing a bit tired of Trump right now. And they might see that, um, depending on where they are in the next couple of years, if the Democrats decide to play dirty, that might swing people the other way again, uh, because people have quite short memories when it comes to politics. But that's the only argument I could think against it. But I mean, I imagine Democrats do stuff like this all the time, because I know Democrats gerrymander as well. Um, so with something like that, again, it would just, I, I guess I'd probably have to see what the vibe of the time is as well. Yeah. Um, sure. No, and it is yeah. true. Listen, I'll cop to it. Democrats are hardly clean players. We we have played. We do, we do gerrymander. No question about it. Mm-hmm. Now, I would argue, and I think most political scientists would argue, too, that the there again, gerrymandering is kind of a great example. Democrats gerrymander, but we don't gerrymander nearly as hard as Republicans do in, like, again, Wisconsin or North Carolina, where you take a purple state and you gerrymander your way into a partisan supermajority. Mm-hmm. Like... That that's what I mean. So it's like that. I as a progressive who's become increasingly frustrated with um, Democrat, what I would consider feckless fecklessness from the Democratic Party. Now, I should also clarify that I don't support indiscriminate violation of norms. I think that's stupid, and to me, that is the real contribution to the danger that you've talked about in your stream, which is setting precedents. I don't think you need to be reckless with this. I think it'd be stupid to be reckless with it and just, here's a norm, let's break it. Mm -hmm. Like Mitch McConnell's a great example of this. Again, he's a Republican. He doesn't just break norms because it's a Tuesday. You know what I mean? Like there's still norms that Mitch McConnell enforces to this day, right? Like he had the opportunity, for example, to abolish the filibuster Mm -hmm. and he chose not to, even though he could have done it. And now I would argue the reason he didn't do it is because he didn't need to do it to do what he wanted to do, which is fill judicial vacancies and pass tax cuts under Trump. That's really the only real legislation that the Republican Party was interested in. They didn't need to break the filibuster to do it. Otherwise, their goal is simply to stop progressive legislation. They want to keep things the way they are. I want Democrats to kind of be like that. I'm not saying go through and just, you know, be a bull in a china shop. But when there is an objective, a good, righteous objective that would progress the country, and tradition is getting in the way, and you have an opposition party that's not behaving in good faith, that would, if the shoe was on the other foot, casually break that norm. I think it's irresponsible to just appeal to the norms and traditions. And to me, I guess going back to the WIC panel, that's the kind of white moderate that I feel like Martin Luther King Jr. was complaining about. Like that when, when holding in the balance progress and just this, well, it's tradition, well, you know, there's, it's inconvenient, all these things. That's not helpful. That's an active hindrance. Um, so, I, I, again, I don't know where you stand on that or if it's just kind of the same thing. It's like, look, man, a case-by-case basis, we agree. Um, is, there any, is there any example you can think of that you would not support? Democrats bending norms or the left bending norms the way the right would? Uh, pack the courts. The thing that I hear people talk about quite a lot. That seems like something. It just yeah, that just seems like something that as soon as that gets into the hands of Republicans, you're just gonna like go into the point of no return. But um, right, the court will the court will be a thousand people. Yeah, by the like, end of the century. I was gonna say though, um, like I feel like the invocation of the white moderate is a little bit like I I, I find that really like hard. Yeah, I'm to sorry, you cut this. out. You said. Sorry? I'm sorry, you cut out. Could you, you said the invocation of the white moderate, and then you cut out on me. Yeah, I'm like I'm just not sure about that part because uh when it comes to the white moderate again like king was talking about white moderates who were upset that they had broken segregation laws peacefully like it was people who i think they just went to have like fucking they sat at like a lunch table or something wasn't it like white and black people when they shouldn't have that was like that was i think the specific they were talking about so i guess and you know king even in that letter talks about how he moderates his own movement all the time so i don't really know where he would stand or like what the whether the moderate or progressive position is correct when it comes to particular like rule breaking within the uh uh within the institutional process um i i don't know because i think you mentioned lincoln earlier and yeah i think because mm-hmm. i imagine with lincoln the re- like uh the achievement we got from him doing that was we ended slavery right in america um Probably a bit. And won, so the, that's and, like, won the, and won the Civil War, you know, it, yeah. it was both. I mean, not everything Lincoln, as a matter of fact, 
I'm pretty sure there's like compelling evidence to suggest that Lincoln was willing to bend on slavery and just the franchise if it okay. meant, you know, coalescing the union. So I think it was twofold. It was it was the result of Lincoln acquiring and, and deploying executive power was to end slavery, but also to restore the union into a single whole. Um, so, yeah, I guess he got two really good results out of what he did. Yeah, which um, to me is obviously a little bit different from, I think on that panel, people were talking about passing Medicare for all, like just without the will, without the consent of the, like, that made no sense to me at all. But um, like Well, and I weighed in on people, that. But, it, it, well, it was funny because I think we were talking past each other on that. And I understand where you were coming from because the way I understood when Wick lobbed that out there as a hypothetical, it was, we, I, was un, I was understanding it to be in the context of Joe Manchin in West Virginia. So one senator of one state, if there was a piece of legislation proposing like a single payer option or whatnot, should Manchin vote in opposition to his constituents' beliefs? Like West Virginians, of course, are going to say collectively, because it's a deep red state, do not back a democratic bill. That's yeah. their general policy, period. And my position was, I think that Manchin should vote for a bill like that, even if his voters don't want him to. Okay. And I think what your understanding was, was should President Biden through like executive order just go, you know, single payer, you know, we're, we're, we're wiping out all, you know, you know, uh, private insurance companies. Yeah, I agree that that would be, we're not there yet. You know what I mean? Maybe I guess you could, you could conceive of a context in which, you know, again, just full disclosure where I could probably get on board with it. I'm sure you could come up with a scenario but I don't think we're there yet. Just the idea of like executive fiat, one man going, yeah, we're just overturning the, the healthcare system in, in this country just overnight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't support that. And actually, it's a, it's a good thing that America's institutions are, are like that, you know, because uh, when people, uh, I'm, I don't know how much you know about the, like the anti-trans legislation, but there is a reason that like, first of all, 90% of those bills are not passing. And there's also a reason that I think, uh, I think it's a majority of the bills that do pass immediately get held up uh, temporarily or permanently frozen by federal judges. Not only that, but because they're being passed in red states, they're getting blocked by federal judges. And I think one example was Tennessee with the anti-drag law that got, um, it was uh, put under an injunction just before it passed by, um, by a federal judge who was appointed by Trump, like a Republican federal judge, because it was unconstitutional. So like the fact that the, I guess that's the double edged thing of white moderates is that actually, thanks to a lot of uh, white moderate federal judges in the uh, Republican federal judges in the on that Republican side are respecting the Constitution, like, probably for things that they don't personally agree with. I don't imagine sure. Republican federal judges care that much for like, uh, trans healthcare for youth, but they're defending it anyway, because of the constitution, or they're defending like the uh, drag thing, uh, b because of free speech, right? Because it's an anti free speech law. So um, I don't really, th that's the only thing I worry about. Okay, so I think I'd probably agree with you on um, that there are probably quite a lot of cases where playing Republicans at their own game makes perfect sense. Um, I only ever worry uh, and get a bit skeptical about people who seem to act as if the argument's been won and now the rest of the country just has to come with us uh, kicking and screaming. That's the thing I try to stay away from. And that's why, especially right now, when Biden is doing so well at achieving bipartisan support for his policies, um, is uh, what I would lean towards. I don't know if you know, actually, with the, with the Queen's death stuff. I don't know if you watched the debates I had over that, did you? I watched the debate you had with Kevin Logan. Um, okay. I didn't. Was there was there more? Yeah, there were like three. There was one with Lance from the Surfs, and there was one with a viewer. The one with I think it was with a viewer. Um, I don't know how if you noticed this talking point come up, but people were saying like we hate her because she could have used her power to do good, right? This unelected autocrat could have used her power to stop the British Empire in its tracks here and here, or stop this horrible domestic policy or whatever the fuck. And I was just sitting there thinking like this is a unelected monarch. And they're like, oh, well, maybe she shouldn't like rule by decree, but maybe she should like use her influence. And like, this is an unelected monarch. And then I was maybe asking just like a few questions like, okay, what if the queen passed like, um, used a rule by decree just out of nowhere to, um, I, I don't know what an example would be to uh, pull the British Empire out of Kenya in the Mau Mau uprising. I'd be like, okay, yeah, she should have probably done that because it's like a uh, massive like short-term gain. Okay, what if it was to stop Thatcher from 
breaking up the unions and closing the coal mines? Uh, yeah, probably. Or what if it? What if she had used it to push uh, uh, legal rights for gay people uh, and legalizing gay marriage before it was done, uh, like towards the eighties and early nineties? Well. Yeah, that would be good too. And eventually, I think you get into a position where I don't think with a lot of people on the left, it's it's hard to prod them into admitting that they're basically okay with like a dictatorship as long as it's what they want, uh, as long as it's doing what they want it to. Um, so th I guess that's the only thing is whenever we're whenever each of these decisions comes, it's like, well, first of all, what would this power look like in the hands of Republicans? And the second thing is, what would uh, this power look like if Democrats are like somehow ended up becoming like radicalized to the point that you were just like even doing things that you know like like again like abolishing the police on a whim or some mad shit you know um a hundred percent yeah no I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you I, I keep going um no, I, okay fuck I'm trying to think of like a way to I explain the way I'm have you ever have you ever read a book called uh the picture of Dorian Gray Oh, like the like the gothic horror novel? Yeah, no, I, we, yeah. well, well, excuse me, excuse me. I, yes, but it was in it was my sophomore year of college, and we literally had a gothic uh, literature class, and we did Bram Stoker's Dracula and and uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and uh, Dorian Gray. Yeah, but it's been forever. Yeah, keep going. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think the gist of it. Well, the gist of it is, you know, there's this really good looking kind of vapid guy gets a painting done of him. Uh, the painting is like perfect, but the paint, it turns out that the painting starts to age and he stays the same. So he's this mm -hmm. like youthful, uh, guy all the way through his life. He's very socially popular, ends up like, uh, realizing that since nothing's going to affect the way he looks, he be, he's like, he's quite vain, quite narcissistic. He uses people, he, uh, abuses like, uh, alcohol and drugs. And he, uh, basically ends up like very degenerate lifestyle. And like, he fucks people over, robs people and all that stuff. Um, and then eventually he gets to a point where this portrait is just this like unbearable like monster, right? Um, mm -hmm. And it like just, yeah, it ends up consuming him. So I think that's the thing I worry about is just like, I feel like when it comes to br like uh, breaking norms and all that, like it might not show in the system very, uh, very soon, but then you eventually reach a point where like you no longer have a democracy and it's just... Uh, whichever one of the left and right wins takes it and then they just go fucking mental. But yeah, that's, um, it's that's interesting maybe the best the way Dorian to Gray metaphor, thinking. you know, the, the idea that, you know, if a person feels like they're empowered to shirk consequences, mm -hmm. like in Dorian Gray's case, aging, right? He can do whatever he wants, live whatever lifestyle he wants because he won't lose his good looks and he won't lose his health, you know, and he doesn't age along the way. And then the idea that uh, you put it off, put it off, put it off. And then eventually, but just, it all like comes back with interest and consumes you. I mean, listen, I think you said a, a, quite a few things that I would just, I would cop to, you know, again, in the interest of good faith. Number one, um, going all the way back to, you were talking about President Biden's legislative accomplishments. No question about it. Uh, again, you look at my channel or my Twitter, I am a, a Biden simp, unapologetic. And again, it's not because like, I love the guy. It's because number one, just objectively speaking, he's accomplished quite a bit. Um, number two, and again, like, I, and, and I understand it because I, I do see this, like, Brianna Joy Gray and, like, other elements of the left, which, like, really frustrate me because they pretend that somebody like Biden, who, as you rightly point out, he himself is a moderate, 100 percent. Now, I would argue he has not governed nearly as moderate, moderately as he is personally, like, because he's susceptible to bullying. I've read there's a really good book written by a guy named Chris Whipple. And it's called The Fight of His Life. And it goes into the, the nuances of President Biden's first two years in office. Biden is susceptible to pressure from progressive groups, especially when his chief of staff was Ron Klain. Like they were able to push him in ways that a lot of people didn't expect. And also, Biden was able to reach across the aisle in a way that I think surprised. I know it surprised me because when he was run, I can work with my friends in the Republican Party. I'm thinking, bro, those days are so long gone. Remember when they told... They told the public that they were going to make your former boss, Barack Obama, one term president, and they weren't going to pass shit mm -hmm. that he did. But Biden was able to, like you said, bipartisan infrastructure bill, um, the bipartisan Safer Communities Act, the PACT Act, blah, 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 all these things. He's had the most legislatively successful uh, presidency, at, at least since LBJ. That, I think, you, you, if you are a liar, if you just don't cop to that. And people can say, understandably so. Well, it doesn't go far enough. I agree. In a lot of cases, it doesn't. But this idea that 
all the progress in the world, if you don't get that and you get just a third of the like, they're, like the idea that if you don't get everything, you've literally gotten nothing is just so asinine because there are people who are alive today because of policies that President Biden has passed. You know, there are pe- that, bi- that bipartisan safer communities law. Hmm. Is it the most aggressive gun legislation I would like to see? No. But there will people there are people who will be alive as a result of those policies. Or what about his again, the bipartisan uh, uh, infrastructure bill? Like there are people who will who are going to benefit again, perhaps not as much as a more comprehensive uh, infrastructure bill or whatnot, but, but like he deserves kudos and he has been able to do it in large part because of uh, bipartisanship. But, you know, you look at it right now and. I think you're seeing the end of the bipartisanship that President Biden can squeak. Like, I don't know if you do you know that like we're we're in this a situation with the debt ceiling. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. So every now and then, debt ceiling reaches this point, and then Republicans hold it up in exchange for uh, concessions, right? One hundred percent. Yeah. So it's basically like a self-imposed credit card limit. Now, mm-hmm. we don't have to adhere to it. Like it's congressional. Like. You know, we can continue to print money. Nobody, no third party is putting this on us. We're doing this to ourselves, and we've done it basically since 1917. Mm -hmm. And in the past 60 years, it's been raised or suspended 80 times. And 50 of those times were under Republican administration. So they're more likely to do it than anybody. They did it three times under Trump without concession, without spending cuts. And that dude was a deficit spending motherfucker. Mm -hmm. Okay. But as soon as a Democrat becomes president, well, now we got you over a barrel. Now, I and others are wanting Biden to invoke the 14th Amendment, which says that the public debt shall not be questioned. And the argument is, in a nutshell, the Constitution says you can't question the debt. So if a subordinate law, federal statutory law says, hey, you got to question the debt, Biden should basically give the federal statute the finger and say, I have a constitutional duty to just tell the Treasury to continue to pay our bills. That's why I'd love to see, because it would disarm the GOP. They, They would just they, they couldn't do anything other than try to sue him, and maybe they could sue him, and maybe it would go before the Supreme Court. But would the Supreme Court really order the president to default on the economy? Hmm. Probably not. So like that, that's where – that's an example of where once upon a time I would have never suggested or supported a proposal like that. But now, why not? If the GOP is constantly going to act in bad faith, consistently so in a way that Democrats simply don't, why shouldn't the president go – no, no. If you have an issue with my spending priorities, we have an appropriations process where you can lay out your budget. I'll lay out my budget and we'll debate it in Congress. But you don't get to threaten me and the country with a default. And by the way, Scotland as well and every other country on planet Earth, because it would it would mm-hmm. run havoc over your economies as well. Like and again, I, I guess it's probably unfair to ask you, like, would you support Biden doing that? You know, uh, but. Could you see situations even with something like that high stakes, if the choices should Biden cave to GOP extortion, which a lot of people are saying he he should because the alternative is an economic catastrophe, or should Biden go bold and invoke the Constitution, even though it's never been done before? Yeah, I, I, I mean, fuck, I think the debt ceiling should just be abolished, right? Like, there's no, what's the point in it? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make it like as, if, as long as you're a growing capitalist economy and a capitalist world, the debt's going to grow, right? <laughs> but I think Republicans just use it because every time the debt ceiling gets reached, like uh, the average voter is just like, oh no, debt. Like, then they get scared. But, and then the, you, you they, guys they have anything like that in the UK? I, I have no idea. I, I don't know. But, like, yeah, I, like, that's actually one thing that I would say is just like it's it's almost anti-democratic not to do it because letting one party just hold up the process because of basically like basically just weaponizing public ignorance, right? Like they're mm-hmm. never Republicans are never going to default. Uh, increasing the debt ceiling is not going to matter because it's like it's like it's just it's just every time it's like they, it reaches a big big number. They're like, wow, it's never been this high. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, the debt ceiling should just go. That's my, that's my position on that. Um, no, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, I'm well, not really against that. Um, yeah, there's our, Um I was going to say as well when you when people talk about like mansion and cinema, um, and I think you're okay, you're saying like you like it sometimes when they vote against the interests of their constituents uh, in favor of the Democrats uh, mm-hmm. because their constituents are just wrong. Like, um, is it not still yeah. true that like I'm reading a few articles here, but is it not still true that like um, Manchin still votes like almost all the time in line with uh, the Democrats? I think even Cinema apparently 
uh, this one article one, I've got here. Hundred percent, one hundred percent, and this is. I tried. I, I, sorry, again, sorry, I tried just, to one, this... just uh, one more thing. I think also it says that cinema apparently has voted with Biden more often than Sanders has. I think cinema ninety three percent of the time and Sanders ninety one. One hundred percent. Okay. Okay. So this is something else that I tried to point out in the panel. I don't hate man. Well, here's the thing. I dislike Mansion and Cinema because when they do go renegade, which is relatively rarely, right? As you said, I think Mansion's in the upper eighties in terms of the number of times he backs the president's agenda, and uh, Cinema's in the nineties. My only frustration with those two is when they do go rogue, they go rogue on the on the shit that matters the most with okay, the most yeah. sweeping consequences. But as I said in that panel, this is again like a, a far lefty position that and I consider myself a lefty and a progressive where it just drives me nuts. People are like, we need a primary mansion. Why? That's suicide. We will never, ever, 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 ever get another Democrat elected in West Virginia without sweeping voting rights to maximize West Virginia voter turnout. And even then, West Virginia is probably red enough that they could just win based on popularity, the, the Republican candidate. And Banchin won't back that, those sort of federal reforms anyway. So we're pigeonholed there. The, the idea that you would let, a, you are so furious with a man who votes, you know, 7% of the time or 12% of the time in defiance of your agenda. And again, critical times, stuff you have every right to be annoyed about. But the idea that you would let that 12% outweigh the 88% in a position where you don't have an like you don't have an alternative other than a Republican who will vote for Biden 0% of the time. Like what? Like, that's insane. Mm -hmm. Cinema. Now I will say cinema is a different kettle of fish because she lives, she represents a purple state. I do think it should be politically speaking, open season on her ass. I would absolutely primary her. I if I were Biden, I would absolutely listen. You either get behind me 98% of the time, you get behind me as often as your base wants you to, which is more than what she does, or we'll primary you and get a more compliant Democrat in there because we actually, that's an option. That can happen. Her polls are in the shitter. At best, she would be a third party spoiler candidate, but even that's not looking good. So that's where, that's my views on them. But if, if given a choice, it's either Manchin or Cinema or two Republicans, hell no, I'll take Manchin Cinema any damn day of the week. They back Biden's judicial appointees, and that's huge. Biden is on track to fill more judicial appointees than Trump did, and that was Trump's big accomplishment other than the, the three Supreme Court justices and the 2017 tax cuts. That's how, the, so to your point about what Biden's been able to do, that's another one. Um, so yeah, I, I want to distinguish myself very clearly from the progressives like, oh, there's no difference between Manchin and Cinema and, mm. and a Republican. That's bullshit. Absolutely not true. Yeah, I think, um, but I suppose that's the thing with the white moderate thing is because like Manchin being a white moderate is only uh, reflective of the fact that his constituents are white moderates. And I think it's really interesting because like with West Virginia, uh, I did a little bit of looking, uh, reading into them, uh, like their voters and I think it's a good impression of what a moderate is, because I think a lot of people imagine that a moderate is someone who uh, sees the left and the right position and just picks somewhere that's dead in the middle, right? But that doesn't mm -hmm. really seem to be the case. I think West Virginia, like the way that moderacy actually plays out is in West Virginia, they are very, very left on workers' rights and unions and all that kind of shit. Uh, and tax it, but like on everything else, like the social stuff, like abortion and uh, whatever else, they're way to the right. Like, I think that's more what a moderate looks like, right? Like um, sure. left on cult, and then depending on whether they're a single issue voter or um, whether they weigh up their left and right leanings on each side. But I guess with Manchin, because he's gone, uh, because he votes with Biden like most of the time, isn't one of the consequences now that he's probably going to lose to a Republican? Like, isn't he behind? He's screwed. Um, yeah, he's behind Justice, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah a, a former governor with the last name Justice in West Virginia. Dude, <laughs> mm -hmm. you're a Republican named Justice in West Virginia. Your first name, if it's Jesus, you're you're like you're a shoe in. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, no, he's 100 percent screwed. He's going to be punished by the electorate for voting uh, with President Biden as often as he did. Um, and it, and that's the thing, like. I try to have a nuanced position on people like Manchin Cinema, and if, again, if you look through my Twitter history, you'll see it. Like when people are like, "Oh, we need a primary," like publicly, like, "No, dude, shut up. <laughs> mm -hmm. That'd be a terrible idea. Be quiet. Just like suffer in silence. Try to get more votes so that Cinema and Manchin are surpluses." I still wouldn't want to get rid of them. Like I said on the WIC panel, my ideal situation is that we have like an Obama era, you know, 
10 seat surplus where we can turn to mansion and cinema and be like, hey, you want to vote with us? And they're like, no, we can't. And then you just ignore them and they have to sit there at the at the table, you know, reserved for the losers in high school. And that's what I would like to see happen. Um, but but yeah, the the your point about moderates. Yeah, there, there's this weird sort of like notion that a moderate is basically somewhere in the middle on every issue. Oh, I, I want I want um, abortion cut off at 10 weeks. Oh, I want abortion cut off at 20 weeks. So, OK, we'll go 15. It's, I, it's just not, I think, how mm-hmm. most moderates are. Like you said, they pick their positions a la carte, right? And some of the positions a la carte could be pretty damn clearly left. And then the other positions a la carte could be pretty damn far right. And so, no, I, I agree. I think that that's how a lot of people are. Um, and again, I'm uh, part of the reason I'm, why I'm sympathetic to, to Manchin is because I understand that he's got to get reelected. And so I'm sure I'm sure there have been times where he's like, God, I'd love to vote for this or I'd, I'd love to vote against this, and, but has to do the opposite for the sake of his constituents. I, it's just I don't think it's going to be enough to save him because, unfortunately, we live in a political climate where and th- this is why I didn't think B- Biden was going to have nearly the bipartisan success that he did is because we live in an era where particularly on the right, you are punished for your bipartisanship. What do I mean by that? And why do I say on the right? Because there are some people like, well, both sides don't want you to work with the other side. It's not true. During the COVID situation, when President Trump offered two COVID relief bills, Democrats enthusiastically supported it, even though it gave Trump a political win. We're willing to do that. We're willing to enthusiastically support a malignantly narcissistic dipshit as long as he does the right thing. Whereas with the Republican base, even if it's policies that are beneficial or even that like on paper, uh, Republicans want, conservative voters want, just the optic of you voting in line with a Democratic president's agenda, you're going to get punished for it in a way that we just simply don't see in blue states. That's the frustrating thing. Um, yeah, but I think what's going to happen is, like you said, he's going to lose to justice and Manchin's going to lose. There's, can't or not, excuse me, Cinema's going to lose to the guy. I think his name is Gallego. He's like a sitting representative who's running against her for the Senate. Um, but yeah, um, I take your point on the white moderate thing. And again, I just want to make those concessions about where I stood on Manchin and Cinema and Biden, because uh, I think you make some fair points there. I guess I, I guess my thesis on this is just I don't think you can bad faith proof a system you know like do you think you can bad faith proof the united states americans where you can design tradition and political activity in such a way that there's no room there's no possibility for abuse by a bad faith actor and still get stuff done because i just don't see it hmm yeah i don't think you can bad faith proof a system uh although it's just it's relative isn't it i feel like america because it's been a democracy for so long uh, seems like it's done a good job of being bad faith proof, but I mean, honestly, when fuck when the midterms were about to happen, I was genuinely worrying that that might be like the last free election in the United States, you know, like or or that or that even in twenty twenty four might be the last free election in the United States, uh, because of how they've basically just tested the water with January sixth and all that. But like, it seems to be like the frenzy around Trump is failing. Um, I don't know if DeSantis is the kind of guy who would be like. I feel, I feel like he is scary in his own way, though, but maybe not in an end democracy way. I, I just don't know. Um, but he's currently, tra- if it, by the way, just sidebar, he's currently trailing pretty far behind Trump in the yeah, polls yeah. now. They're no longer neck and neck. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but I would also like to think that if uh, that January 6th hearing goes to the DOJ, uh, that Trump should never be allowed to run for office again because he tried to coup the government, you know? Um, yeah. Like, so, yeah, it's, but then I don't know, maybe it's better that that waits because if, if he does run, he splits the vote with DeSantis, right? Like he could do, um, like, cause I have this, I, I have you, this, I have this fantasy of DeSantis winning the primary and then, uh, Trump running as independent to spite him. And but, spoil him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That'd be, dude, you know, he would yeah. like, that's the thing. Some people are like, well, maybe Trump will get behind the Republicans, even if he's not the nominee. No shot. No shot. Mm. Absolutely not. You're 100 percent right. He would that motherfucker would run. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know if we can, cur- the, but he would run as a as a third party spoiler easily, and he would absolutely be effective. You know, the sad thing is, you mentioned about January 6th going to the GOJ, so it's under investigation by a special counsel. The weird mm. thing is, 
you know, which I have to remember, a conviction for Trump for 90% of crimes, he could still theoretically hold office, right? It's got to be impeachment or they have to charge him with sedition or treason mm -hmm. and prove it. So those are the only two options. Obviously, impeachment's not going to work because of Republicans won't convict. Um, and then, so, so Jack Smith, the special counsel, is going to have to charge him with sedition in order for this to work, and he's going to have to be convicted. Um, that's going to be tough. But this dude, this dude's a badass. I, I'm sure you probably don't follow it, but this Jack Smith guy, like he's he's a machine, man. He subpoenaed successfully uh, Vice President Pence, even though Pence fought it. He is like he's been handing out subpoenas to like Republican officials left, right, and center. Like it's it's exciting. I'm I'm interested to see where it goes. Okay. Um, we I did have a question for you though in the UK context too, while we were talking about good faith and bad faith proofing a system. Okay. This is my impression of the UK, and I want you to correct me. Again, as an, outside, an outsider looking in, you all don't have, if I understand correctly, a written constitution. You have, you know, like all these historical documents, statutory law, precedent, and tradition. And yet it seems to me that you all have been, relatively speaking, much better bad faith proof than the United States, even though we do have all our shit on paper and all these like formal checks and balances and no hereditary monarch, you know, who, who could theoretically exercise royal, royal prerogative and all these things. How the hell has that, if that, if number one, if that interpretation is two, how the hell have you pulled that off? Um, I actually don't know if, yeah, I don't know if we have it. I guess it's something you never hear of. Like, I, that's why I feel like with UK politics, um, I don't even know what that whole unwritten constitution thing is all about. I've never understood it because I feel like I've never had to, right? It just seems to be that, um, a majority party gets the majority of the seats and they just pass laws. And sometimes it can, or even like, and you've got like unelected lords who can hold up laws and push them back for review or push them back for amendments. <laughs> that seems to work as well. I have no idea. Um, yeah, that's really weird. I, I guess it like, hmm. It's, I mean, again, just like as an outsider, it's like, that shouldn't be the case. You know yeah, what I mean? No. There's no, you, you think that I would think that your system would allow for so much more opportunity for abuse. And it seems to be like, like even your Boris Johnson, right? Like, again, correct, correct me if I'm wrong. Cause I didn't like track his premiership like intimately. But he didn't go to nearly the extents in terms of like authoritarian tendencies and things like that that Donald Trump did, right? Yeah, I think there was a bit of a scandal with the uh, the amount that they spent on PPE and the way that I think some of the money might have gone to seems to have gone to companies that were like supporting the Tory party or that were like personal connections. I think the problem with the UK is not so much the system, but it's like it's like our class system and the fact that we have a very, very archaic, like private school system and uh, university system that basically just allows this like uh, generations old elite that sometimes links even back to the old aristocracy that gets the best education in the country, gets the same PPE degree from fucking uh, Oxford or Cambridge and then becomes prime minister. Like we have one college in uh, England that has produced 25 prime ministers. So, um, that's maybe more oh, of our problem wow. is like the uh, like class stratification in the UK and the way power is distributed there. That's definitely, I think, more of our where more of our problems come from. But also, I just don't know. Like our our population is just very right wing. Like we're just very like when conservatives win in the UK, it's because most people wanted the conservatives to win. We know we like you can have a situation where you get less votes but more seats, but it's very rare. Um, Who and actually, the last that system labor, labor minister. More. Yeah. Is, isn't is, isn't like your last four or five prime ministers like uh, obviously Sunak, or Truss, Johnson, Cameron? Am I missing somebody, or was there somebody in between Cameron and Johnson? Like, weren't they all mm -hmm. conservative? Yeah, we've prime had ministers? conservative since twenty ten, uh, so thirteen years, and before then it was thirteen years of labor. Yeah, gotcha. oh, yeah there was uh, Cameron. Sorry, it was Cameron, to Ther Theresa May, Theresa May, Boris. Yeah, that's one. Boris, Liz Truss, Sunak. Yeah. Gotcha. Do you think that trajectory will change anytime soon? Uh, Tories are fucked. They're way, they're just getting rammed in the polls. Um, it, the economy is the top priority for voters and Tory economic policy is just never going to be good enough for the public. So I think they're on the way out. Uh, you all don't have set elections, right? Like, because the elections, you know how we have them. It's, it's, it's this, it's no, you know, first week of November or whatever, first Tuesday of November, every four years presidentially. Like, that's not how it works in the UK, right? 
you can have snap elections here. So we had an election in 2010, which was a hung parliament. It was Tories and Liberal Democrats who made a coalition. Uh, then it was 2015, Tories got a majority. Then 2017, after Brexit, there was an election. Labour did really well. It was a hung parliament. I think the Tories got in with the, uh, the DUP, a very far right party in Ireland, Northern Ireland. Um, then 20, then, then Boris comes in because Theresa May failed with the Brexit negotiations, I think. So there's another election then. Conservatives get a majority again. And our next one is like, yeah, it's like four or five years. So yeah, next year. Interesting. So you don't think Sunak will be prime minister next year if things keep going at the rate that they have been? No, um, no, I think he's fucked. Uh, lots can change, um, you know. Sure, but Jesus, yeah. I think I, I don't know. I think the British public just like they get bored after ten, fifteen years. That's so. Thatcher, like, like Thatcher and the Tories were from I think nineteen seventy nine until nineteen ninety seven, so nearly twenty years. Then we had Labour for just under fifteen years. Now it's going to be Tories for under just under fifteen years. This, this seems that to be what we've so done for the last cyclical. Yeah. That's interesting. So does that mean Starmer would be he's gonna as the as the you know leader of labor, like it, again based on current trajectories, like you expect him to assume the premiership in the next election, or would it be somebody else? I mean, when you look at some of the polls, Keir could like they could be I think Tory uh, we have like six hundred seats or six hundred and twenty or six hundred and thirty seats in, in parliament. Um some people there's some 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 of these polls are predicting that uh conservatives will have double digits in the next, which is probably not going to be the case things are already starting to narrow a bit more but i think so far he's um so may 15th three days ago he was polling uh how am i doing my fucking math 12 17 percent ahead 17 points ahead so labor currently 45 percent of the vote conservative 28 yeah okay so, so that's the other, and again, at any, any point you need to, to go, let me know, but I love picking your brain on the UK stuff and like comparing it. Cause, okay. Did you ever play um, like real time strategy games and like world building games and stuff like that? Uh, when I was really, really young, I played uh, <laughs> Star Wars Rebellion. That game is a fucking Fair enough. banger. And uh, I also like, what is it? Uh, I did play a little bit of TFT, but not that much. Mm -hmm. so. I like that. So you're like, when I was young, before I had a life, yeah, no. But like, one of the things like I love thinking about as a politics geek is like, you know, I, I remember it was on a message board and always like triggered me like design your own, like if you had like a small island nation and you had to design a civic structure, what would it look like? And, you know, these like hypotheticals of about like, what if you had to now, you know, in 2023, having seen the pros and cons of a system like America's and, and the United, uh, United Kingdom and stuff like that, like, what would you borrow from each? You know, would you keep your head of state and head of government separate? Or would you consolidate them as, as we do in a, in a presidential system? Mm -hmm. Do you like that your chief executive, the prime minister is part of the legislature? Like, you know what I mean? That there's not that separation of powers, your government and your legislature are heavily intertwined in a way that it's not really the case here yeah i don't like it because um like i don't know because it wasn't okay so wasn't it there a thing about trump and i could be completely wrong isn't it the thing about trump that he just didn't really pass as much legislation uh nearly as people thought he was going to is that true no no you're right yeah yeah he was yeah so like the, he made some big promises like he was going to repeal and replace Obamacare and that didn't happen. He promised for four years that there would be an infrastructure law and he failed and Obama, or Biden got it done in less than one. His things were judicial nominees and tax cuts. Those were the two major legislative accomplishments. Um, and, and, and sidebar, real quick, you mentioned the filibuster way back when. That's another reason why I as a progressive do not want to abolish the filibuster. I support strategic legislative carve outs for the, uh, for the filibuster. Yeah. But the filibuster is a tool and it's like a hammer, right? So a hammer can be used for a good thing or it can be used to like crack a baby in the skull. And the idea that we would just throw the hammer away, I, I, I think that's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Like we've Democrats used the filibuster successfully to stop legislative attempts uh, by Republicans during the Trump administration. So yeah. why on earth would you just throw it aside? modify it like like certainly go back to the days when there was a standing filibuster because the way the filibuster works now here in the states it is stupid basically all the burden is on the majority party 
all a minority party has to do is just threaten the filibuster, like, hey, you won't get 60 votes, and then they can dip. They can go home, and the majority party is scrambling, like, how the – like, no, no, no. If, if there's going to be a filibuster, it should be the way it was back in, like, the 50s or 1800s where there was a standing filibuster. If you're the minority party and you want to stop a majority's legislation, you can do it, but you're the one with the burden. You have to stand there live while the majority kicks back, and you have to talk nonstop and basically run down the clock instead of the opposite – which is a minoritarian obstructionist party can just threaten a mm -hmm. filibuster and and dip. Now that I do support switching that back, um, but yeah. So so that was part of the reason why Trump was so legislatively unsuccessful is because Democrats were able to successfully employ the filibuster. Yeah, um, which is you, which we don't get here. The the House of Lords can push legislation back. Um, for a little bit and then eventually just goes with with amendments and then and the lords are not elected they're appointed so off the top of my head like the conservative party and this is what really scares me about them is like how far right they can push the country just with this complete veneer of like normalcy and respectability so as soon as they came in after 2008 they uh raised the cap on tuition fees for universities from three thousand to nine thousand pounds a year they um pushed through all these massive austerity measures that like pushed up unemployment. They uh, basically allowed um, employers to almost like redefine work with the way that uh, think everyone started to go like a more uh, part time with like very, very limited wage increases. Um, they changed the benefit system uh, to universal credit, which basically meant like less money and it's harder to get. And uh, it's a much more humiliating process to try and get uh, benefits when you're out of work. Uh, they would had this system set up to check whether or not disabled people were fit for work and it was also like a really humiliating procedure where uh some people who were like uh who couldn't speak and were like blind were found fit for work and then they would like commit suicide two days later because they lost their benefits um their migration policy is like insanely draconian they're like trying now to deport uh, asylum seekers to rwanda like to get processed there they had the brexit referendum they're giving out like oil contracts right left and center um uh, they gave tax cuts as soon as they came in. Like they've done, they've closed libraries all over the country. They do so much, and the anti-protest bill, and the left can't do anything about it. They just let it happen, you know. So like, you all on a federal level, York, you, the the UK's conservatives are much more legislatively successful by far. It sounds like than Republicans are here at a federal level in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, like we don't. I mean, we're not even a federal system, so yeah, they they do. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Damn. Uh, well, like uh, the the immigration one is that. So I don't know if you. It, uh, this is where I get most of my political commentary from. This is my site, like my UK political commentary. I don't know if you like this guy. I love him, James O'Brien from LBC. Yeah, he's he's our he's our bonger debate bro. Yeah. So okay, wait. Okay, I could hear it in your voice. Do you like him or do you hate him? What what what's your thoughts on James um, O'Brien? He's not as left as I'd like him to be, but no, he's yeah, he's good. He's funny. Yeah, I like most for the most part. Yeah. Your exports to the uh, the I, I he he's not an export. I wish he was. I wish you all would give him up to us. Um, but you gave up Mehdi Hassan. Uh, Mehdi Hassan is a bad mamma jamma here in uh, the uh, American press corps. Um, yeah. I don't know if you follow him, but he is a beast. And what's interesting is to hear, you know, because that's another thing I was going to ask you about. You know, the way that the UK approaches power like in terms of interrogating it, it's really weird. And I don't know if this is like ubiquitously true, but like, um, like we all do like PMQ. <laughs> it's like it's yeah. so funny to hear this, like your subordinate minister is like getting in the face of the prime minister. That, I shouldn't say that would never happen here in the United States because like we, we do hear like the president being heckled more and more by like Mac, but dude, Kevin McCarthy would never dare get in the face of President Biden, you know, and start like shit talking him the way that that you guys do at PMQ, and even um, even the press. Like mm -hmm. I, I've I've listened to uh, soon. I've listened to a couple of interviews with Sunak and everything else. Like there just seems to be. I don't know if I want to say an irreverence. Maybe that is the word I want to use. Like it does seem like you all in the press and within the government are much more critical, even if it's in bad faith, I, I don't know, but much more critical of power than we are here in the States. Like, it, it, do, you, do you get that vibe? 
yeah like uh, so much of it is uh, again it's just like posh boy debate club and even with the press as well because the press have the same problem where there's like a very small group of elites who all live around the same area as each other just kind of like in charge of everything uh because of deregulation of the press meant that there are very few massive media owners who control like a fucked under the media um it's just like I don't know. I just like I think the problem with our political system is just like the media as well as the political system is just like a playground for very wealthy people. Now that is changing a lot more than it had done in the past, but yeah, that's like and I, so that combined with the fact that you just have like such a disconnect from politicians and like regular people. Yeah. And yeah, the, do you the, like the, the way that people address that though? Like do you like how PMQ gets and and how the press will grill your leaders um or would you prefer a more civil or respectful approach i don't know what you would call it here in the states where there is where, where people approach power with more reverence than it seems like they do in the uk no it's it's entertaining um yeah i like i, I mean just i have no idea if it leads to better outcomes to do more like i guess like german style consensus politics i don't know i think the conflict stuff is really funny but i have no idea if it makes the world better or worse like the fact that um like even again when it comes to precedent usually before prime minister um like a parliamentary election uh andrew neil if you know who that is will interview will interview the leaders but boris when he was up against corbyn just refused he just didn't turn up and corbyn got bulldozed by andrew neil so yeah um and that was like a really big event that boris just dodged so no i i, I like the grilling stuff it is funny to watch paul but it just shows you though that tory politicians will take grillings so badly and fuck up so hard but still just stay in like as cabinet ministers for like years and years and years so yeah it's, it's interesting stuff. Well, listen, I, um, I'm going to pop off here in just a few minutes, but I really do appreciate the conversation and, and it didn't go, you know, I was going to pick your brain on like so many like particular instances, but I, I'm also sympathetic to the fact like, you know, these kind of like, what if hypothetical, what about this? What about that? It's, it can, it can drag on. So I appreciate you letting me like redirect, uh, the flow of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, and I understand your position, I think, a lot better than I did um, during the WIC panel, because like I said, it seemed like incongruous with what I'd seen from you in the past. But I think you further clarified, like, look, this was a very specific conversation up against a very specific cadre of progressives that are deranged, um, you know, or at least come off deranged in that conversation. Um, uh, so I, I get it now. I, get, I understand it better. Um, but uh, um, yeah. That's that's really all I had, just the the clarity and and I think that there was more consensus between us than um, than perhaps I suspected early on. So yeah, cool. Um, Wick is in chat saying he'll fight you on moderates. I don't know what the fuck. Oh, if he wants to do it's gonna happen. Or... It, it's gonna happen. Unfortunately, I can't. Like mm -hmm. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna dip out here in about ten minutes to go back to work. But uh, yeah, Wick and I spar on this all the time, and, it, and it's it's this ongoing. You know, like that Batman and Joker thing, where like we're destined to do this forever. That's probably Wick yeah. and I until the very end. Um, and and now Wick, if you're still listening, I'm gonna get Loner Box to to help me. So it's gonna be like a two v one, and we're, apparently we're gonna do a, like a a um, an intervention for Wick at, at some point. Uh, progressives to uh to walk wick closer to the left than what he is so yeah i mean fuck i don't yeah like i i, I don't know I, I think for me like that discussion is just like like i i just feel so much more comfortable trying to move people over to my side like that's what i tend to go for and that's whether that's like very extreme people on the left or the right like at this point um yeah but i guess it, it, it does seem that when some political situations there does need to be a bit of dirty play but yeah, I just Fair wish enough. it wasn't that, that wasn't the case. But yeah, Oh, me whatever. too. Like, my, one of my favorite shows, dude, and I say this again, there's some things I've said during the course of this conversation which would probably cause me to lose my progressive bona fides, but um, The West Wing is one of my favorite shows. I don't know if you ever watch it, but that is like okay. enlightened, centrist, you know, liberal, wet dream. But we don't live in a world written by Aaron Sorkin. So I, it's like... I love the idea of a loyal opposition just debating things in good faith and and agreeing, broadly speaking, on the values and, you know, and get, get engaging with each other in good faith, but just disagreeing on the particulars. Uh, but that's not the world in which we live here in mm -hmm. the United States, if we ever lived in it to begin with. Um, my last question for you, just kind of for future reference, what are some like political topics that you're passionate about? Um, because again, I enjoyed the conversation and probably would like to pick your brain about 
other stuff in the future, but I do want to see if we have some like shared interests, even if we disagree on them. So are there like particular topics, I don't know if it's trans rights or free speech or like what, what are some things like politically that you, um, you focus on? Uh, yeah, trans rights, free speech. That's uh, definitely two of them. Um, been doing a lot of, uh, Weimar and Nazi Germany stuff lately, just like reading about it. Um, I don't know. I'm also interested in all the crazy stuff, like the fucking sub kind of enjoyed like doing race realism debates back in the day, even though they're kind of like, uh, brain damaged, but, um, yeah, uh, Ukraine is a big one. Palestine's a big one. Uh, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, the, uh, it's, it predates the Weimar Republic, but one of my favorite people to read about is, um, uh, Otto von Bismarck. Yeah. Um, because I, dude, listen, I think there's a compelling case that he might have been the most brilliant statesman in international history. I think at least top five. I mean, like, I've heard the, I've heard so many mixed opinions and like people credit him for things he might have or might not have done. Or uh, yeah, it's it's really weird. I don't know about much about him, other than like yeah. the kind of like there was a kind of like cult of his memory during Weimar Germany that was maybe not very healthy. But yeah, I don't, I don't no, know. No, I well, it, and it's it, funny how ignominiously his career ended when he just gets like shit canned by by the the new kaiser i mean so yeah i mean certainly much more flawed than a lot of his apologists say but in terms of uh like the political maneuvering that he did even if the ends were not for uh always righteous causes um like he's fascinating to read about hmm. but yeah dude I, look i took up a lot of uh, your time i appreciate the conversation hopefully we can have more in the future i wasn't able to see your chat so i don't know if they hate my guts but uh, i'm sure there's plenty to talk about in the future and uh wick we will spar very soon. So thanks, cool. man. Yeah, if you want to shout out your channel in my chat, you can, or you can send me a link and I can post it in there. I'll do both. So I'm at youtube.com slash at pondering politics, one word. Again, sock damn progressive, but a huge Biden simp because above all else, we got to keep the GOP out of power. So I appreciate it, dude. I'll send you the link. Cool. Thanks, man. See ya. Whoa. All right. Sorry. Right. Be short. Oh, he left. Okay, cool. <laughs> We're just getting the link in his fucking... He's got one of those preview videos. Oh, God. Cool guy. Yeah.